All right, welcome to the Interp Town Hall meeting, which is being sponsored by Interprod and Summit Debate. My name is Jenny Cook. I'm the executive director of Interprod and Summit Debate, and we're very excited that you're here today. I'd like to take a quick opportunity to tell you a little bit about our, the structure of the town hall forum today. First of all, we have little index cards that hopefully you've all gotten a chance to get your hands on. And we have asked you to write a question if you'd like to, something re relevant to Interp that our expertise, our panelists here, could help you kind of get to the bottom of. We want this to generate a discussion. We may not have all the answers. This certainly isn't an opportunity for us to sort of dictate policy or, or the rules changes or anything like that, but to basically sort of expel or to share um, the beliefs of, like I said, experts who have been coaching kids you know, total number of years on this panel, I mean, people that have coached well over 20 some years in the activity, who have coached a variety of interpretation events. Um, we have such great diversity from across the country, different types of programs, small and large. And really, this is a panel that we're bringing back from last year. We did the exact same town forum here last year. And it really generated some wonderful discussions. So this year, though, we're turning this more to an audience-directed type of question and answer session. So once we collect your cards, we're going to, Joelle will bring it up to me. So if you can, if you have a question that you want us to address during the hour that we have together today, please do us a favor because we're on a live feed. If you could gently pass it. Okay, all the way down to the end here. And if you all can pass it forward to Joel, then he can get it to me and we'll make sure that we try to address that. I'm also gonna be sort of theming some questions. So if we get questions that are very similar, the same topic, we're gonna try to deal with them at the same time. And then finally, we'll address your question and then I will turn to a panelist and I will ask them to give us a response and kind of some direction, some ideas about what they think in an answer. And then I'm gonna ask for one or two of our panelists to additionally respond briefly to that as well. So you'll, see, you'll get to hear perspectives from a, probably two to three of our panelists on each question. And then at the end, at about three o'clock, we're gonna wrap everything up and give our panelists an opportunity to maybe just kind of give a final summary or address anything that maybe we've kind of talked about, they have an additional thought about. And so our goal is to really be out the door by about 3.05, 3.10 max. Um, so again, I'd love to get us started right away. Thank you so much for coming. It's, it's such a great day here to be in Birmingham, a wonderful start to the tournament. We wish you and your, your competitors, judges, coaches all the best this week. And I'm just gonna get it started by introducing our panel. I'm gonna introduce each of our panelists. We'll start down at the end and give them an opportunity to maybe take a few seconds and tell us a little bit more about themselves. So at the very end, we have the wonderful Jackie Young from Missouri and she has just been inducted into the Hall of Fame. Hi, I am Jackie Young and I am from Blue Springs High School, Missouri. And I have been coaching, uh, I've been at Blue Springs 39 years, and I have been coaching for 34 years. And don't ask me how many years I've come to the national tournament because I haven't counted. <laughs> uh, it's been a delight. This is my third time in Birmingham. And every time I come, I see new faces, young and old, and it's exciting to be here. And I will go ahead and stop at this moment and pass it on to Joe. And next we have Joe Wyckoff from Minnesota. Hello, hello, good to see you guys here. Say hello, let's hear you say hello. Uh, I have, uh, I'm famous because I'm married to Pam <laughs> Wyckoff. This is, uh, I just really retired for the second time. Uh, I was in education for 48 years and for over 40 of those I was a coach, but uh, like, these guys here. I'm not a professional coach. I'm a teacher. And everybody in this room, that's what we all are. We are all teachers. Even if we coach, we are, we are teaching. There are three groups of people. People who watch things happen, make things happen, and say, what just happened? <laughs> and our objective with you guys is to, I'm not going to say a lot here, but m my point is this. I'm not a tech guy. I don't like tech. You guys do. Many of you. I don't get it. And every time I go to a workshop in tech to learn how to do something and I walk into the meeting, they're already on step five. <laughs> because some of the hot dogs who understand it all have a fancy question and they're already up here and I'm thinking, 
how do you turn this on? I need for you to start at the bottom. And I think too often in, in any workshop, that's what we do. We get too hyped up about the final round and the tapes and so forth when you guys in here have questions where you would say, take it back to the very beginning because that's where we've all been before and we'd love to be able to talk with you about that because our job is to give it away can't, and we're looking forward to doing that. So thanks for being here. Thank you, Jeff. And our next panelist has a birthday today. Sarah Rosenberg from New York. Happy birthday. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It is such an honor to sit on a panel with these wonderful friends and esteemed colleagues. Hello to Dave Kraft. I know we're all thinking of you and wish you were well. So anyway, my name is Sarah Rosenberg and they call me Rosie. Way back in the 70s in Los Angeles, forced integration took the form of busing and a brave group of people, and students and parents, decided they would give minority schools a try. They came to my school, we did a big production of Bye Bye Birdie, and that coming together of different ethnicities, of different economic levels, students and teachers, was amazing and the parents saying everything is rosy, so it <laughs> stemmed from them, from uh, their singing. This next year will mark my 54th year of teaching. One of my early years, my first year in speech actually, one of my students, Julio Matos, made it all the way in dramatic interpretation to uh, the final round and we were driving him home maybe 2.30 in the morning and bullets were zinging over the car. And I knew that his father was crippled from gang warfare, was in a wheelchair. And because of his speech, I knew and it became very true, Julio's life was changed. He had a chance, all because of the good old NFL that I couldn't say last year, NSDA. Uh, so now it comes trippingly off the tongue. I'm very, very proud to be a coach, which is Joseph as a teacher. And especially proud of this honor organization that changes lives. I also am co-artistic director, hello Lou, of Open Hydrant, uh, an equity theater company, the only one ever in the Bronx. And there's a whole row of chairs up here if you guys yes. want to come up. We would love to have you come sit up here. Come join us. All you poor people standing, <laughs> right? So I believe in diversity. I believe in all children having a level playing field, having a chance in life, and thanks to NSDA, they get it. Hey, hey Mr. Fiola. All right, our next panelist is coming from the great state of Pennsylvania, Mr. Tony Fiola. Hi, everybody. I'm glad to be here. I've been on a four-month health hiatus, and I'm feeling a lot better, and feeling especially better being here. So it's good to be home, so to speak. Um, I've been doing this for a while. I first read JV Poetry in 1972. So since that time, having coached at one high school for uh, 36 years, uh, a college university for 20 years, I've really taken it upon myself to see the evolution of Interp, to try to understand it, uh, to appreciate it, maybe not to like it, but I kind of know what's going on, and I like that. I'm an observer, and I don't often say much, but when I do, usually it makes sense. So I'm happy to be here for that reason, and I appreciate Jenny inviting me back again. And then we have Mr. Byron Arthur from the great state of Louisiana. Thank you. It's really um, humbling to be here with all of these great folks in this activity. And one of the reasons why it's so humbling is in my secret other life, when I started this, um, I was a debate coach. Um, and I love debate, and it's amazing. Um, in this life, what I have found is that 
so much of the transformative power of this activity is in interp. So many of um, giving young people a chance to tell the stories that are important to them are in what you do. Um, and so for me, it has been a tremendous joy to jump into that world you know, where so many giants in the activity are, like the guy sitting next to me and the people down there and, and, and Gabe Rasher and, and Scott Waldrop. Um, and it's humbling for me to be here and I appreciate the opportunity to share this forum with, with them and with you. Thank you very much. And Sarah made a reference to David Kraft, who is unable to be here today due to a, a slight leg injury. So he is joining us from South Florida. He's probably watching right now. He will not be able to be Skyped in, but he's sending good vibes and I'm sure is probably holding up notes or something. Remember to say this. So hi, Dave. <laughs> All right, so we are going to go through, and I, I see quite a few great questions here. L some of them are more like rules or procedure types of questions. Some of them are very philosophical questions about the state of the events or interpret general. And some, you know, some great questions here that I think are maybe even from some students seeking some advice on kind of where they should be going. So I'm going to take the first question, and I really think it's it's probably um, probably we're going to start out with poi here and. I think it's interesting as we're talking about the evolution of POI, the question is, what do you predict about the evolution of POI? Will it change as dramatically as we as witness, as we have witnessed duo changing? And I'd like to t uh, address this question with Miss Jackie Young. I kind of thought she was gonna ask me this. <laughs> Remembering when duo began, it's funny how you would say that, and how it has so dramatically <coughs> evolved from when it really was like two people standing there side by side, either giving a humorous piece or a grammatic piece. And now we know what we see in duo, there's so much movement, so much animation, that, uh, and so many levels to a piece that to watch it is amazing for me. But to watch Poi, yes, I think it's going to change because we change. And so in watching that, I think that what has Poi in, I won't say a stagnant state, but a rather narrow state, I think partially is the idea that it is a new event for us. And yet, even though we're doing on the high school level, we see the influence of college strongly. And if you are an interp coach, then you see the strong influence of the college field. So in a way, it's not a high school activity. If you have that strong of an influence, then you're depending on where you're competing. If you compete in the Midwest, we have a tendency to be uh, slower in some of the movements and things that we utilize. If you are a school that possibly travels the national circuit, you're experiencing different things. And yet when you come here to this tournament or go to any other national tournaments, you gotta be ready to play with the big boys. So I think we all need to be ready for the change that's gonna come. It's just like Joe has mentioned about the tech thing. I'm just like him. And yet if we're going to compete, we've gotta learn some of it. So I think for everyone, be ready for what's gonna happen with POI. I think also the NSDA has gotta look at the idea of the parameters that we have now about which types of websites we can go to. POI is a website activity. And so we've got to be ready for those types of things as far as those legalities are concerned in reference to the different types of POI. Watching it last year, we have one year tapes that are available. It will be interesting to see how those changes will happen for this year's national final round and how it has evolved in just a year. So I am really excited to see what's gonna happen with POI because I'm excited especially because now we have a book event that is a national qualifying event. And I think with that, great things are gonna happen in America and the NSDA. Um, Jackie, I have one quick follow up with sure. that. Another person asked about the question is, why does POI require a book but the competitor is not required to read from that book? Why is it that it's a book event and yet you aren't required to read? Uh, well, you could say the same thing about if you watch poetry, 
which it stems from that. Uh, I have been watching poetry for years. And at least I remember in 09 when I had a young man doing a poetry. And I think it's with anything they do with a book event, you memorize it. You're going to memorize it. And I think the way, but I think the idea of, it's a different event from the perspective of the book tech that you create and how you use that book. And if you'll notice again, in colleges, everything they do is in a book. And so they, I think the idea is it gives you that advantage of moving forward. Some coaches may like it. Some areas may like that idea. But I think it's because you, you make choices about what parts you want to read and which parts you don't. And I think that's probably more of a regional thing mm -hmm. as to how you end up utilizing that book. Okay. At this time, I'm going to have two pe people from the panel offered a little bit more response to both those questions. Mr. Fiola has the first one, and then Sarah Rosenberg would have the second. You know, books are there because they serve a lot of purposes. Number one, a platform. Number two, a place where you can show the change of time with the turning of a page, or the change of place with the turning of a page. The turning of the page accompanied with a body shift means you're in a different place and in a different mindset. And the old school, three, the old school way of approaching it is it's a place where you can internalize when you don't want to address face to face somebody in the audience. You know, you actually could internalize to the book to show your thinking. Okay? That's what that was an old school trick that we used to use. So there are three three of my responses, you know, to that. I look to the great state of thank you. Of California that has an event called thematic and term, where you have three or more pieces linked together, da 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 da, and a book is required. When I first started, it was the New York way, you must address the book, 50% of the time, look up and involve the audience. And slowly over time, you saw in California, the book, was able to be used not only for reading and as a platform, as Tony says, but also as a prop, as an item that could really seal the artistic intent of the piece. And then as I would judge at college tournaments, like Tony said, you would see the brilliant use of just the turning of the page or one book, I couldn't believe in college, I tell my students to this day, he had lined some sort of gunpowder, whatever, around the edges of his book, and it suddenly went on fire, pre-planned, and he flung the book, and he had another one in his back that he pulled out from his book. I mean, really invented, it was all on gunplay, and it was like, okay, you have our attention. So I do think that POI, much like TI, who I feel so important saying all these, you know, TIs and POIs, but that really uh, the, the event will see more and more use of the book as a prop and yet always offers, Tony said, that platform or that space where the reader can delve into the material very personal level. All right, we have a couple of questions related to singing or song lyrics in Interp. So I'm gonna direct, um, I'm gonna read one of them first and then I'm gonna have Mr. Wyckoff address this first. The question is, how do you feel about and do you recommend singing in Interp? Yeah. Better have a good voice <laughs> if you're gonna be singing. Uh, I come from the, the state of, Minnesota, and anyone here from Minnesota, we have stupid rules regarding singing. Like you can only have so many notes or so many measures. And so it's not a matter of does it fit in with the theme of it's where they're counting the notes to make sure that there's no uh, violation. I think that uh, I'm really interested to hear what you guys say about, about Poi and the book. And I think singing it kind of follows the same way that I would think with that, that Good is good and bad is bad and talent's talent. But when that book or when the singing begins to be the main thing, 
that runs the piece, then, then no, then we're selling out. You know, and then that begins to be a gimmick. And I fear, I know that it's another area, the same thing happening in informative, where the visuals begin to get to the point where, wait a minute, I thought that the kid speaking was supposed to be the focal point. The same thing with singing. If you can sing I, and that can add a dimension to what you're doing and sharing your truth, then I think that is fine. But if you're just doing it to show off that you can sing, then I think that audiences will pick that up. And so uh, for the most part, I think it's every individual kid and coach has to decide. And then a, a technical question that, Joe, if you could quick answer for us, if you can, and then um, I'd like to have Mr. Arthur respond to the singing question as well. Do song lyrics used as transitions need to have original sources provided? Was the kind of the question, then can we simply write it in and or provide a copy of the lyrics? I think POI is a little different than the other, how that might be used in like a DI or an HI or duo. So maybe we can clarify that. Can you ask me the question again? Yeah. Do song lyrics used as transitions need to have original sources provided? I don't know, what do you guys think? <laughs> <laughs> I've never done it, so I, I, I don't know. Does it need to be yeah. in the script for you to sing it? Is that what the question I, I think that I think what they're, and I think there might be coming from two different areas, because in, in POI, they do say the, the source, okay. right, they have to say that, and I believe in, in like a DI, and HI, or a duo, if it is in the play, the yeah. music lyrics are in the play, it's part of it, uh, musical theater, or, you know, it, it, you're doing a DI and uh, the person is singing, and then it would be a part of it, but you couldn't take additional lyrics from a, like Beyonce's lyrics and add it to, you know, someone that was, you know, well before her time and add those lyrics in. I believe that's where that was directed. And is well that correct? I, I, yeah, I think that, that in particular right now with the NSDA where, where we have really, you guys know from turning in all your stuff in the office, all the rules have changed. And you better be aware of what those rules are. And so what I would say is that uh, y you follow what the rules tell you that you can and cannot do. And if they say you can't do this, then that you can't do that and don't complain about it you know, later on. So I've never really done that okay. uh, before, but uh, life is nothing but a series of choices, most of them wrong. But the right ones are out there if you'll think it through. And I think the same thing is true uh, in, in, in turf or oratory or whatever. You have to make a series of choices. That's a creative choice. And so uh, it's up to the coach and the kid. Okay. I like singing. And I like it because it, it adds to the piece. It shows me a lot about the talent and creativity of the young person who's doing it. Um, and there are a couple of pieces out there that I've seen. Um, in fact, I had a young man do Marvin Gaye one year. Um, and there's a Luther Vandross piece that's running around. And so I, I, my caution there is that takes some guts. If you're going to stand up and start singing Luther um, and you run the risk of, you know, is the person now comparing my voice to Luther and how far away am I from doing that? And for a young person to pull that off, I think, is outstanding, um, but I'm on the same page with Joe. If if you want to sing for eight minutes, then you should join chorus, um, <laughs> and yes. you know, and not do <laughs> and not do dramatic. So it has to be just the right amount of si of singing that it adds to and does not become the focal point. Okay, great. Anybody else want to follow on that? Yes, sir. If you can get POI, and you have to have X number of sources. <laughs> Yes, indeed, have the song lyrics. You can download those. Um, as one who loves to use music in pieces, especially duo, and yet I can't sing a note, I love if it enhances a piece, not if it overwhelms or if it's the only purpose, like Joe said, to show that you can sing. Go join the choir. Okay, we have a, our next question is deal, we actually have three questions that I kind of believe deal with the overall, like what you're seeing in trends in DI and HI. And, and one of the questions I think might handle all of this, but if not, I may sink in on a couple of specifics. What does the future hold for DI and HI in terms of added tech? Will tech eventually take priority over script choice and then slash that with 
Um, there's some questions about in DI, it seems like it's becoming the spectacle, what's happened to honesty and subtlety. Some would ask the question, is there a line basically in HI in the national circle? Like how far could you go? So I guess the question is to you, I'm gonna ask Sarah this, to answer this one, is sort of what do you think in terms of DI and HI in terms of that sort of added tech, the added moments, and where, where is that going? What's the trend? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I don't look at trends. I just look at what I like. I'm mm -hmm. old enough that I can be that dogmatic. Tech is wonderful. It, it adds to the team. We have a little eighth grader who's going to be here Wednesday competing. And uh, she came running up to me and said, I need tech, I need tech. <laughs> I said, you need to memorize your teeth. <laughs> 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 I don't think it's shaping me, that's just me. I think it's to tell a really good story and if the tech is indigenous to the team, uh, I mean, I love dramatic because dramatic can be funny and become then very poignant. And uh, humor can become dramatic. It's like blurring at times. So, oh, man, the mic. I, I'm sorry, I've got that big, my mother used to say, speak up, Sarah, so anyway. I don't usually use my, I do. Okay, but anyway, um, tech, if it fits. Okay, and then Mr. Wyckoff, Joe, you had a response. Yeah, just uh, for all the, the people I heard, just, just my advice, uh, and I don't care whether it's oratory or whether it's in terp, uh, take the stairs. We live in the age of everything is technical. They got the elevators and so forth. Mm -hmm. I don't care what event you're doing, take the stairs and do the tough stuff right in the very beginning. And quit watching final round tapes thinking that that's what your kids need to be able to do. Are you crazy? You know, and so in the very beginning with kids in, in Terp, one of the things I never would do is for a new kid, I don't make a cutting for a new kid. Are you kidding? You got a file. You hand somebody something. You work with a group of people all together doing things in drill work on what do you do to get the best of your head and your heart. And it's a building process. It's the same if I could make a reference to oratory. The last thing that we ever do is write. That's the last thing that we ever do. You know, Lincoln said that if you have eight hours to cut down the tree, you sharpen your axe for seven to cut it down in one. You do your preparation first. The last thing you do is actually write. The same thing for uh, interp. And I want to make one final comment. If we have a, a lot of kids doing really well and all they're doing is tech, don't blame the kids. We're the ones that mark ballots. We're the ones saying that's cool. We like that. We think that is good. So we need to get on ourselves if we don't like where the trend is going as opposed to the kids. But uh, uh, anyway, that's what I wanted to share. And then uh, Mr. Fiola has a quick follow-up. At the airport, I wore this jacket, and I was stopped by about 40 people <laughs> who thought, wow, I love the sparkle in that jacket. And I said, yeah, it was $15, but uh, I like the sparkle too. We all like some sparkle. Okay? Was that a good oratory segue, Joe? I think it was. I think Joe would approve. We all like a little bit of sparkle, but this is my caveat. I like to show all these final rounds to my non-forensics classes, and some I won't show, because the average Joe and average Jane who is not into forensics would go, that looks stupid. That's weird. What is going on? So Joe used to say, Lanny Nagel and one of my other heroes used to say, you know, it needs to pass the common man acceptance first before you consider whether or not the sparkle is going to outshine what the ordinary person in the audience will accept. And I'll just say that. All right, we have two questions here. I'm gonna direct these to you, Tony. 
and they kind of along they're along the lines of do you have recommendations or tips for finding the right piece and then the other question is the best way to find original topics that apply to you I was one of the first people who used to run some of these camps years ago uh, UT and the old FFI the inter portions then later a little bit with oratory and I would just find every possible international dramatic publication source, you know? And there are tons of them. Now I think they're kind of common. But I used to look at a place called Dooley where every listing of every international publication is there. Legit, you can buy it, okay? Uh, there's even some new publications, I know Dave is aware of it, Indie, I-N-D-I-E. Tons of things are published there. Uh, most people would stop at French and dramatist, okay? But I always went to the international to find what was new, to find what was different, okay? So, you know, always look for, always put England before something or Australia before something. You know, any country, Canada, well, I'm sure you use Playwrights of Canada, but you could put Zimbabwe, you could, and you will find interesting material, okay? That's what I used to do. That's how I found a lot of material for the interp camps that I used to run. Other people can say other things, I can too, but let's hear what everyone else has to say. Somebody like to add to that? Sarah, and then Jeff. Yeah. Read. <laughs> Read. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Jenny was saying that Dave and Ryan Knowles were just spending time in the drama bookshop. Read, go, now plays actually have a little um, excerpt on the back to let you know what it's about. The old days, we didn't get that, you read. <laughs> Never stop reading. Turn off the TV and read, have your students read. One thing I would beg you all, I think that w w is the only downfall of forensics, the students who find work that is published, they copy the work that they see. They'll go and say, what won DI in 2010? Oh, look, and the coach, perhaps not knowing, has a, just an exact copy of another coach's, another student's work. I find that terrible. So um, that I wanna caution against. Copying material, terrible. All right, Jackie. I'm going to ditto some of that as well. It, it is read, read, read. We don't read anymore. Uh, we read magazines. We read stuff on Facebook, on other types of social media. There are things that you can put in a microwave, but the best cakes are baked. And so we need their everything doesn't need to go out with the bath water, as they used to say. <laughs> throw the baby out with the bathwater. We need to sit down and read and take time and spend time. Because some of the best camps that I have sent my students to, they spend all day just reading pieces. They're not being given, here's a cutting of this, and yes, I buy those pieces, do those cuttings. But what I have found is that at the end of the season, when you have to turn in these cuttings to NSDA, and you tell a kid, okay, let's go back and find every single line and every single word that you have to say, you find the real climax in the play. Because they didn't take the time in September and October and the other earlier parts of the year to actually sit down and read the entire script. The climax isn't always on page three or even when they go to order plays, because I have my students order plays, they don't even read the entire synopsis of the play. Mm -hmm. Or they'll buy a play that's ordered because as well you know, you purchase a play, you're stuck with the play, good or bad. You cannot return that to Samuel French, dramatist, or anybody else, <laughs> Eldridge even. That, it doesn't happen. So, but they d and then I had them analyze the play and they read three pages. The best way to find scripts is read. So if they are strong literature students, if you're reading in the English classes, you're reading in history classes, then you're gonna find great pieces. They don't have to be scripts. Same thing for humorous pieces. Go to Barnes and Noble or some, go to the library 
where you can get it for free and actually sit down and read, just sit in the library and just read. Have a reading day where you're reading the entire book, but you've got to read it from cover to cover. Because if not, if you wrote something, you would want someone to read the entire thing and not judge you just from w your little synopsis that you have at the beginning. So whoever wrote that and it was good enough to get published, they deserve for you to read the entire script or the entire piece of literature at all times. Okay, great. Now this next question I'm going to direct it here to Byron. And it's how would you recommend diving into a piece meaning really get into a piece and be able to perform it well. Well, it's actually fairly consistent with what we've just been talking about. You need to read the entire piece. And I know that there are people who come from big programs that have big libraries and there are things that are already cut. And the temptation is, let's go get what's in the file cabinet and it's highlighted and it's cut and let's deliver the piece. But I think you do yourself a, a, a tremendous disservice if you don't do that. So the first thing, if you do that, the first thing you have to do is read it cover to cover, maybe more than once, because that way you understand what the author is really trying to get you to understand about the entire story. The second thing is you need to spend time analyzing the characters that are there. Not just the words that they're saying, but get a sense. What do you think they look like? What do you think the voice sounds like? How do you think that character, based upon what you're reading, might react in other situations, okay? And that way, you become so intimate with that character and so knowledgeable that you're not just standing there saying words in a particular voice. You are responding and behaving just as that character would. That way, you'll be able to bring it to life. And I think the third thing is you need to find a story that you want to tell, that you are passionate about, that you feel that the people in whatever room you're in really need to hear. And not just one that you think, oh, it's going to get a reaction from them, one that means something to you, and in that way you know it'll mean something to other people. Okay, there's one quick follow-up here on how do you create that character then that an audience can fall in love with? Well, I think you, again, you have to be as honest with that character as possible. And that's one of the things that was, um, that was talked about earlier today, right? Has, has it lost its subtlety and has it lost its honesty? And I think you need to figure out a way um, to present that character in such a way that we see a range of their emotions. We see their, we see their vulnerabilities. We see what they're like when they achieve some success, right? I mean, it's not, and, and that's where something like tech comes in. Don't cover, don't cover him or her up with your, you know, with whatever gimmicky sparkle um, there might be. <laughs> but I do, but you can put him in this jacket. Um, you know, don't cover them up with that. Let us, you know, understand more of what that character thinks and, and what they feel. Okay, Mr. Fiola, follow up. Similarly, uh, I think when you create any character, you have to find the saint in the sinner and the sinner in the saint. You need to create a tension of opposites because we need to like the bad guy. Otherwise, we're going to be repulsed by the bad guy, you know. And if the good girl or the good guy is too poly purebred, she's going to get on our nerves and he's going to make us want to go to sleep, okay. <laughs> so it's always good to find the opposite, to imbue that in the character's personality. And then he becomes and she becomes more interesting. Yeah, Jackie, yeah. Thought, uh, another thought. The, there's a difference between a character and a caricature. And too often, especially as novices, they often are the ones who sometimes get the cuttings because we don't always, if you have a larger, pro well, you don't have to have a larger program. You don't have time to go through this process or you have a varsity who that's the way they were taught. So they feel this is the way that you, they in turn are supposed to teach a novice. Don't cheat a novice because they become varsity and they're discouraged because it's overwhelming. 
but we have to teach them how to create people. And it doesn't matter to me what event you're doing or what you're doing, we need to learn how to create real people. And to me, the best way that I tell my students to create real people, watch people. You notice that if an accident happens and you try to describe that person, they say, well, the person was whatever race they are and they were large. Well, come on. How many whatever color people they are are large? So, but we don't teach them. They've got to learn how to describe a person or describe the event or regardless of whether it's historical or not. And the best way to do that, I think, is to actually watch people. They watch us. They can create us, I guarantee you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, but if you ask them something about you, they'll be in a corner creating you. They Snapchat us. I mean, they take pictures of us all the time and put it out there. And if you don't think they're doing that, <coughs> yes, they are. <laughs> so, but yes, begin with, that might be a beginning process. If you're stuck with watching, I always tell them, don't don a trench coat and go peep in somebody's window to observe people. <laughs> don't be a creepy person. But you at least need to be the person where that you are watching people, real people, and then you'll see these levels that Tony has talked about, about of how people change from day to day because none of us are the same. Even twins, I mean, twins, triplets, whatever, they have different personalities at different times of the day. So that's a wonderful way to help create characters. All right, have we have a question. It's actually thought it wasn't going to be a follow-up question, but I'm going to address this kind of the panel and I'm let you answer it first, Jackie, since I think you're kind of addressing that if we are to kind of observe people and try to take that snapshot and then incorporate what we believe are their character types. Mm -hmm. This person is asking kind of a, a question I think might get at this. We have to look at caution, cautiously. How can we prevent negative stereotypes making it too far? in these pieces, may they say at nationals, but even just making those negative stereotypes get too far in the pieces. And they use an example, they said like an HI using slang for a black woman or a horrible ter stereotype like, you know, like hitting the head or, you know, again, I think we've all seen some of those stereotypes and pieces. I'm gonna let you start with it and then anybody in the panel who might wanna address this. I think it goes back to what Joe was talking about earlier. Uh, we try to make people get a reaction from people. And unfortunately, we live in a society where we are mimicking people. That's where you get into the caricature rather than the character. And so if you delve deep enough, you will find that people don't, everybody in that stereotype doesn't act that way. And again, it's back, how much work are you going to do? You have to research and you have to study. Because I guarantee you, if you are you just trying to get a laugh, are you trying to create people? And if you go back and you watch the way that this, this is another evolution of especially in humor. When you watch the thing sometimes that uh, you'll see the different levels of humor. But how clean are you in creating those characters and really trying to feel, you know, what message do you want to send? This represents you. What message do we want to send in these pieces that we choose to do. And each character is vitally important. And so you've really got to research. Humor is not a joke, especially if you have multiple characters, obviously, that you're trying to create. So I think it's up to the student and up to the coach about the message that you want to send and that you really research the types of characters that you want to send, you want to present to your audience. Anybody like to follow up, Joe? You do your best acting, your best interpreting in the silence. You don't do it on the line. And the ultimate comp, uh, you know, this is just personally what I believe. All great communication is narrative and all great narrative is metaphor. But you do your great acting in those straight looks where I see something happening in the ellipsis, where something is going on and it's inside of you and it's in your eyes, not with the word. You take me there before the word and after the word and you make something, you make something happen. And Jackie, you're right. I don't care whether it's human or dr humor or drama or poi or whatever. That is the objective because kids and coaches, the greatest compliment that you will ever get in any event is, I believe you. I don't care how you did that. I believe that kid. 
that kid was telling, telling the truth, which leads me to this point. You guys have to do on your team, I don't care how big it is, a diagnostic. They don't come in and tell you the event that they're going to do. No, we're going to have a little kind of a run through here with a variation of different events. I'm going to watch you, and I, they call me coach. I can pick up what you're going to be overall best at, and I will lead you in the direction where we can maximize your potential. Some kids want to do humor, and they're not funny. And so <laughs> they think they're funny, yeah. but we, we need to say, no, that's not really the direction. That's what the sports coaches do. Why do we think that we're any different? But the ultimate compliment is I believe you, and those straight looks, when you're not speaking, that's when I can tell that kid's an actor. Sarah? I know that we often start with improv games or exercises because I can tell very quickly where a student's strength might lie. I also know that as speech coaches, we are so lucky. We get to spend an inordinate amount of time with our students to really get to know them. We travel with them, we spend long hours with them, and we need to enter their world and find pieces that give them a voice where something has happened in their lives, they can channel part of their emotional connection through a character. Because Joe is right, what do they say the best dramatic acting is invisible. You just believe this is from the heart. So the more we know our students, the better it is to, uh, the better chance we have of channeling them in a really great direction. Okay, great. Our next question, I'm going to direct this to you, Joe, and it's, it's kind of an, an interesting question, I think, that we need to address, because I'm not sure that it is addressed, to my opinion. Um, how is NSDA being inclusive in the script submission process and they use the example of non-binary pronouns? And the use of what? Non-binary pronouns. What's that mean? Amen. Okay. So uh, what's the question? So the question is, how is the NSDA being inclusive with, let's say, the example of non-binary pronouns in the script submission process? Oh, does someone else want to answer that <laughs> question? I don't. Do we know the answer to that? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to say I believe that's new territory. It is we are live and this is going to go to the, you know, the NSDA. We will say that this is a concern. Um, and in terms of if and I believe in the script submission process, you must submit the actual literature of the script. So if you've picked an author that chooses he versus she, I, I mean, I think, you know, that right now is we you can't go and change those words, but I'm s certain that this is something that they can address possibly another discussion, I think, but I, is there any, I don't think anybody in the panel has an in, in influence on that or knows? No? Because right now isn't the rule you can't change the gender. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay. All right, so the, the last one before we move on to two, or our last two questions are gonna be very kind of philosophical, but I have a quick one um, that is dealing with pop culture, and I'm gonna address this to you, Rosie. Um, do you think pop culture has influenced interp selections, and if so, how? Absolutely. Our students spend an unfair amount of time in front of the TV set or on the computer <laughs> or on their cell phone. That's life. I mean, I'm one who was born and raised in a library. They are on their phones, and so I have to appreciate the fact that <laughs> they love going on YouTube, or Facebook, or whatever. I know that pop culture will, uh, will influence so much of what they do, but I'm also there. I'm the captain of the ship, actually, and um, I will listen to you, and I want to hear what you're saying, but ultimately, I will decide, is it too much of this or that? Does it even fit? Um, a favorite person of mine in college uh, speech and went on to coaching, now he's making movies, said that he was so, <laughs> 
impressed by um, a movie that he saw by Tarantino. Every other word was an F word. That, that was his selection for DI. Quentin Tarantino's speech, Reservoir Dogs, and I said, oh, well, did you not have a coach to, he said, oh yeah, my coach said absolutely not, but I did it anyway. So, you know, whatever's out there, we stay the course. We have to be teachers and guide them. I know Joe's going to say something about that. No, you're right. <laughs> uh, we are high school coaches. This is not about right or wrong. It's about appropriate and inappropriate. And they call us coaches, and we have to make those decisions. In light of what you had, had mentioned, uh, I'm not a fan of rap, folks, where they spit and talk backwards. I don't get it. I don't understand what's being said. And then I saw Hamilton. <laughs> and that is an example of where they took the pop culture, but in it they weaved in historical truth to the point where I thought this is a genius work and I bought it and that's the bottom line at the end do you buy it or do you not buy it and I bought that truth because this is about this is about truth and so I think that that's what we have to really as coaches end up saying is is as the coach is that appropriate mm -hmm. this is not off Broadway this is high school this is an honor society and it doesn't doesn't mean that you have to be prudes or whatever but you do need to be able to say, if I had this kid's mom and dad right here and the principal of the school and the school board president here with me, I'd be proud to be able to show this as opposed to I'd hide hoping that no one would find me. So you got to use your head. All right, I'm actually, okay, sorry to interrupt. We just have a few minutes left. I do have, I saved two sort of broader philosophical questions for the panel. Uh, the first one I'm going to start out with, uh, to send to Tony here. And it's, why do you think some schools continue to win year after year? What methods do you feel a winning school uses? <laughs> well, if you have a coach like Joe Wyckoff <laughs> or, or Rosie, anybody on this panel who has years of expertise, <laughs> that helps. But I think what also helps is when you have one student who gets it who's willing to be the new coach. And then when he coaches a person who gets it, in other words, you create a family. When you create a family and have those generations, you're more likely to have success than if you don't. I also remember years ago, uh, one of my orators, Joe Jones from 95, and uh, had a lot of success, and Joe and I pretty much realized if you want to learn, you watch all the final rounds. You see the kind of things that have made it all the way through. Okay. And then if you like something locally that didn't make it all the way through, you know it didn't pass the general consensus, it just passed the local consensus. So you can watch and you can learn that way. That's a couple of my comments. Okay, um, Byron. It's about culture, and it's about having a culture of high expectations, and uh, you know, and, and, and obviously having a coach that has been there for some time, and then having someone that that coach has coached step in and take over the program. But it's all about continuing that culture of high expectations. It's not about I've got five good kids this year, and hopefully there's some more good kids after that. It is about, it means this to be a competitor at Leland. It means this to be a competitor at Holy Ghost Prep. And that gets passed on year after year after year. The young people realize, I'm part of something that's bigger than me. And, and you have to be willing as a coach, as a teacher, to be unapologetic about that each and, each and every day, from the way that the students dress, to the way that they practice, to the pieces that they choose. Um, it's a heavy responsibility, but that's why you see the same schools consistently on the stage, 
or near the stage because of that culture. Okay, I, oh, go ahead. I want to say one thing that is a sure winner, practice. <laughs> There's nothing like it. And the coaches that are successful, I mean, I don't know about your students, but not only know if I'm ever successful, but we have what we call our little, uh, what do we call it, Lou, when we use our phones and we have a little communication going on with every student. I know immediately if they're absent that day, why, uh, what's it called? Yes, that's it. See, <laughs> look, I'm 73 today, so that's my excuse for not knowing all these things. But, Manuela, were you tardy? Why are you absent? What do you mean you were at a doctor's appointment? You get your butt to school. And remember, it, it's true. I'll be to your house to drive you if you can't make it there. Mm -hmm. Why do you not have lunch today? Why are you eating a candy? All this, and then rehearsal starts at 410, and it's over at 7. And they're going to school from my students 7 in the morning, and they don't get out till 410. Good. Then you hit my room. And then we'll do homework together for an hour to make you eligible. Um, Norberto Troncoso knows every grade, every teacher <laughs> comment, because otherwise our students won't be able to play on that level playing field. They don't always come with the same background. They have such talent, but oftentimes, they're not used to somebody kicking them in the rear to say, you can do this and you will do it. And you will come to practice. Because with, without practice, there is no winning. All right, we have one last question. We're just about out of time. I'm gonna send this one to Byron here, and it's, what ways does speech and debate change the lives of your students? For my students in particular, it's, it's about the program. Um, it is about giving young people who were ordinarily silent a voice. It is about the brotherhood. It's, all boys Catholic school. It's about the brotherhood that they find in this program. It is about having a place where they can come, where they are loved on their good days and on their bad days. And when you mix all of that in, at the end, you come out with confident young men who are ready to take on whatever challenges that are coming their way. Um, that's how it changes. And, you know, sadly, I don't see that in a lot of other things at school to the same extent, because you know that what happens in our programs is that we challenge young people in very unique and different ways, and we challenge them to be good people, and we challenge them to be good performers, and we challenge them to play well with others, um, and we challenge them to love and help other people. And that's why this thing that we do is the very best thing that young people can do in a school. Yeah, I, I, thank you. Yeah. We're about to wrap up, but I have Mr. Wyckoff that'd like to respond. I, I don't care how, how cocky or arrogant or uh, over the top some of your kids might act the bottom line is this, they often feel like the not real attractive 14 year old looking at the magazine of all the beautiful people. And in their head, they're thinking, I'm really not that pretty and I'm really not that attractive. I'm not really that smart. And I think the greatest thing that our activity does is it allows every kid to know you are enough on your own and for that, I'm grateful to be a teacher. And Jackie, last comment. Uh, the one thing I was thinking about, it's a safe place. It's a place where no matter where you came from, where you plan to go, you're accepted for who you are. That's, it's the place where they can come and be themselves, not be ridiculed, not be judged, not be questioned. And too often, even at home, that's not what happens. And so we end up being mama and daddy, and not even though we could be old enough to be grandma or even great-grandma, it doesn't matter. Uh, and
and that's where it is for them. And we watch lives change. Other teachers don't get the, the joy of what we see. And even though we have long hours and long days and long hours and long days, at the end of the day, you think about all the students that you left at home that didn't get to come to the national tournament. It gives them a challenge to be ready to walk through that door one day. It's the legacy that we try to create and so that when we walk out the door, that the legacy will continue because we all spend those long hours and we hope that we will make an impact on some child's life at some point that will help them to go out. We teach life lessons. They may do pieces, but we teach life lessons so that they know how to stand up and talk to anyone about any subject and not be disrespected. It's about the respect for the activity. We don't care if they like us, mm -hmm. but it's about the respect. And if they learn to be respected, no one will ever abuse them and get away with it. So that's, that's what I think makes the success in the programs that we have. It's because we all teach those same life lessons. Sarah, 30 oh, seconds or less. But hey, I'm so proud, but our students are from the lowest congressional <laughs> district in the nation. If you think about that for a moment, when I first came to New York and I took my students to 43rd and 8th Avenue and they saw a tall building and they thought it was the World Trade Center. They said, I thought this was destroyed. And it was like, oh my God, speech, NSDA gives them the opportunity to travel this country, to meet the most amazing students from all over. And kids are so beautiful. They react to each other. They form friendships that go strong way after they leave our nest. So thank you, speech. Thank you, coaches. Yeah. And I want to say one last final thank you to our panel, our experts. Thank you so much. And thank you to the NSDA, the Executive Council, and everyone in our national office here for making this opportunity available. Good luck to everyone this week, and enjoy. Thank you.